And uh, the precedents that are being set with this, uh, people really need to understand this isn't just about Ross and me and the, and the case. There are very serious precedents being set with this case that will trickle down into the courts in the future. And we're at a tipping point in history right now. And the courts are grappling with how to deal with all of these things. You're listening to The Corbett Report. Welcome, friends. James Corbett here, CorbettReport.com. Today is the 10th of June, 2017, and we are talking to Lynn Ulbricht. And I'm sure that name is familiar to a lot of the audience already, but for those who are not familiar, Lynn is the mother of Ross Ulbricht. And the website that you're going to want to go to to get informed about Ross Ulbricht and the case against him is freeross.org. Of course, that will be linked in the show notes where you can read about the story of Ross Ulbricht, who was arrested in October of 2013, charged and eventually convicted of being the founder and administrator of the Silk Road website. And that is a large case in and of itself and lots to go through. Again, I'm sure a lot of you have heard this story in other venues before, but this is your first time on the program. So Lynn Ulbricht, thank you very much for joining us here today. Well, thank you, James, for having me. really appreciate it. Well, it is uh, very important to talk about this story. Uh, As anyone who's familiar with the story knows, this is about so much more than any one individual. This is about concepts uh, that range all the way from the judicial system, the the judicial process, and uh, the right to a fair trial, to the ideas of agorism and and other subjects that I've talked about in my work mm-hmm. in the past as being essential to the way forward out of the uh, the problems that we find ourselves in today. So it's a very, very important case to talk about. But before we get into the case and the details of all that, perhaps we can set the table for today's conversation by talking about Ross Ulbricht as a human being. Mm-hmm. Uh, can you tell us about him as uh, as you know him as a mother? as a child, as a person, what was he like in, in the world? Ross is an exceptional person and people who know him and meet him say that pretty much consistently. Um, he was a very, he was a pleasure to raise. He was very, um, easygoing, mellow person and he still is, uh, but very intelligent. Um, lots of fun, uh, just a very pleasant person and he grew into an idealist and um, someone who was very compassionate. There's a hundred letters that were written to judge Forrest about Ross from people who knew him personally, including four inmates. Uh, And they paint a picture of a person who is rare, exceptional and in his compassion and his idealism and wanting to, make a difference in the world, as well as just an easygoing, um, down-to-earth human being. And even journalists who said they were talk- spent hundreds of hours talking to people about him did not find one person to say they disliked Ross in any way, and in fact, quite the contrary, that he was interested in helping the underdog, that he was always he was very sensitive to others. That's really what he's like. He's he's a really amazing guy, and he's handled the situation so well and made a difference in the prison, tutoring, teaching classes, um, you know, just been a blessing in there. So I think very highly of Ross. I'm not saying that Ross has no faults or to make mistakes, or but he's um, a person of integrity and um, idealism. And his background and his original interests were in science? He was a physics major, and then he got his master's in material science. He was never a computer programmer, as the media says. Uh, Never knew a lot of programming languages or was very versed in that. Uh, He's a scientist, yeah, and he, he was very interested in how the world worked and worked in solar energy and, um, all kinds of interesting things and wrote academic papers, which I couldn't understand at all. And, you know, he's, um, and then he became very interested in <clears throat> the Liberty movement with Ron Paul's campaign and in Austrian economics and agorism and those philosophies. And according to the story that we've been told through the, the case that was brought against him, it was in 2010 that he began working on what became the Silk Road and ultimately led to his arrest in 2013. Can you tell us about 
the Ross Ulbricht story from 2010 to 2013 from your perspective? What was he doing at that time? What was he talking to you about at that time? Um, you know, he was um, doing he he was doing financial things with people. He um, he was working on a Bitcoin exchange. He told me about Bitcoin and asked. I said, "Well, should I buy some?" And he goes, "No, mom, it's too volatile." I think it was worth about a dollar then. Uh, so not very good advice there. But um, so he was an entrepreneur. He had a a book a used book selling business that actually he donated 10%, I think it was, or 8%, I think it was 10 to charity. Um, and actually he's been involved in lots of volunteer work, but, um, yeah. So he worked on the computer and had different adventures. He went out to San Francisco because a friend said, Hey, I'm going to do a startup. Do you want to be involved? And he thought it'd be interesting. So he, he lived very simply. And um, so that was, that's what he was doing from my point of view. He did spend time with us. We, we have a business in Costa Rica that's off grid, out in the jungle. And he spent six weeks with us during that time. I don't see how anyone can run a worldwide, um, you know, bazillion dollar market from there. It, it barely sent an email. But in any case, um, yeah. He, and he loves nature. He loves being out in nature, and which is very hard because for the last three and a half years, he's been in New York City in a very confined place that's um, he's now been moved. But um, he still isn't. He's in transition at the moment. So towards I, uh, from my understanding, and I haven't gone through all the documentation and I don't know the case back to front like you do. But from my understanding, it was during the time at which sentencing was coming up that Ross wrote a uh, a letter to the judge asking for leniency asking for to be spared his later years uh, in yeah. life knowing that there was at least 20 years sentence coming um, and in that letter he admitted to founding the Silk Road website yeah, he, did. he admitted to creating it he he had the concept and in fact previous to that he had um, created a video game and actually there's a LinkedIn passage about I've created a um, economic simulation. He told me the economic simulation was that video game. It was um, kind of modeled after World of Warcraft or Second Life type of thing, but it was based on Austrian economics. And his idea was to have this video game played all over the world where people could have an experience of voluntary free market interaction through a video game. And he talked to people about having it published. He did. He entered an entrepreneurial contest with it. And it, it ultimately didn't sell. But, um, yeah, so that's he was very involved with that. All so, right. So, he so said, I forget. Yeah. Anyway. Well, so from the question? outside perspective, then this looks like an open and shut case. So here's this guy. Mm -hmm. He's admitted to founding this website that was yeah. this vast drug or uh, yeah. organization. Um, he was caught in the library with his laptop open it with it logged in as an admin, administrator, DPR, Dread Pirates, Roberts. It seems like an open and shut case. What then is the defense? Why why would you put up a defense against the, these charges? Well, just to be clear, he was in the library downloading the Colbert report. That was um, in the trial. And yes, he did log on when the um, DHS agent came on and had him do that. Um, I don't I we know now that he certainly wasn't the only person with that login because after trial, um, it's been discovered that another Dread Pirate Roberts used that account to log in after Ross was arrested. So, yes, he did that um, when he was coached to do or to, asked to do that. But he says that he was set up, that he kept back into it, that he got out of it, was working on a Bitcoin exchange. And then at the end, uh, up, back into it, but that he wasn't running it the whole time. The, the defense was not permitted to explore this. It was, um, they had a different perpetrator in their sites, Mark Carpellis, and um, this was all coming out from the government's own evidence at trial with Jared Duryagin, who's a DHS, DHS agent. And what happened was, as he was about to close in on Carpellis, and he had, um, he had probable cause for warrants and everything. 
um, DHS Maryland, which is the site of two admittedly corrupt agents now in prison, alerted Carpellis by taking over $2 million from his account. The next thing we hear from at trial was that Carpellis's lawyers approached DHS Maryland and said, we'll offer you a deal. Um, we will give you DPR's name if you back off our client. The next two weeks later, Ross was arrested. This is very, very interesting. I think it raises some doubt. I certainly would have liked to have heard more about this, but it was shut down. And the next, and when the Try, when we got back to trial, the judge said all of those that questioning was off limits and we could no longer pursue that. Um, and as I said, and since then, we've also it, the defense has discovered evidence tampering, which was there was a press conference about it last November, which indicates a third corrupt agent deleted evidence. And there's just so many unanswered things that remain sealed and undisclosed. And. Even if, though, let's just say, even if every it is an open and shut case, which I don't believe it is. I think there's a lot more to it. Double life plus 40 years for all nonviolent charges is horrible. It's 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 a uh, brutal. And um, so I don't see how it's defensible. 20 years is a generation. It is a long, long sentence. And to give someone double life without parole. There is no hope. It's a death sentence, really. Um, is a, is a really um, it's really wrong. And Ross isn't the only one. There are thousands of people now serving life who are nonviolent in our system, and it's growing. It's a record number of people. It's a serious problem. So, can you talk about what the judge said in her sentencing? Was were the factors that influenced that really remarkably long sentence? Right. Well, she uh, leaned on uncharged allegations of murder for hire. The government never brought those charges to trial. They talked about them. They were based on digital evidence, um, which any expert will tell you is very vulnerable to tampering, planting, deleting. Uh, she relied on that to justify her sentence, even though Ross was not charged or convicted for it. Uh, she also referenced his philo philosophy. Um, and the philosophy of the, of the site that called the government troubling and dangerous. No, she called that troubling, called the government the oppressor. And um, she considered that troubling and dangerous to call the government the oppressor and said, well, I'm not sure that's a philosophy you've given up. And so in, implying that, well, he has to stay in a cage for the rest of his life because maybe he would still think of the government as an oppressor when he got out in 20 years. That is a First Amendment problem, in my opinion, to use political views and philosophical views to bolster a draconian sentence. Um, so, you know, there, that, those were two things that really stood out in the sentencing that I thought were really wrong. Um, there were also parents of people who had died of drug abuse, allegedly from drugs from Silk Road. We hired a pathologist who said there's absolutely no way you can prove that. In any case, that would mean every website host where someone bought something on the site would be liable for that person's death. For instance, Amazon sold cyanide to a teenage girl and her mother suing Amazon, saying Amazon's responsible. And you can see how this is a slippery slope for vicarious liability that is, is way out there. But in any case... It wasn't proven that these people died from Silk Road and that Ross was uh, responsible for this. But it was brought in sentencing. Frankly, it seemed like a circus to me to have. And it was, it was awful. I felt really bad for these people. They've lost a child, even though, you know, they were Ross's age. Well, one was anyway. It was like they weren't children, but they were they'd lost them. And uh, I understand that. But I don't see the place in a sentencing. This is not proven at trial. This was never proven at all. And that was relied on. Um, there were many things in, at the sentencing that bolstered this sentence that um, I think shouldn't have been in there. She could have given him 20 years. And um, that's a long sentence, you know, but um, I, I think it was punitive. You know, the, the, um, there's a Sentencing Reform Act that Congress passed saying a sentence should be 
sufficient, but no longer than necessary. She never really said why it was necessary to give him that long a sentence. And it's not. Ross could leave today and he would not break the law. Ross is, you know, not going to do that. And certainly in 20 years, he's not allowed on the Internet. So in 20 years, not having been on the Internet to, to think that he's a threat to come build another Silk Road is absurd. And yet that's what they're doing. And they said they're doing it to set an example and deter others, which is completely hasn't happened. And in fact, the opposite has happened. It, Darknet sales have increased tremendously and the sites are much bigger than Silk Road ever was. So it hasn't deterred anybody. It hasn't served any purpose except to waste Ross's life. Let's just backtrack a little bit, because I think one of the most startling parts of this story that I think still a lot of people don't really know about in depth are the fact that the, we know there are convicted uh, DEA agents and agents of, of various sorts that were absolutely <laughs> involved in stealing from the, the Silk Road site, completely corrupt agents that had access to tamper with various chat logs and things, that their evidence was presented in trial, and the evidence that these were, in fact, convicted agents who, who had been rogue uh, was disallowed from trial. That's really startling. Let's talk a, a little bit about that aspect of the story. Sure. Well, not only was their evidence disallowed, they were not allowed, to, the jury wasn't allowed to know they even existed. And one of them, Sean Bridges, who was working for the NSA at the time, by the way, the defense didn't even know he existed until after trial. And the defense fought this and said, look, this is relevant. The jury has a right to know that two corrupt agents were not only stealing from the site, but they were experts in crypto technology. They had the ability to change passwords, PIN numbers, chats on the forum and the marketplace, they could act as many aliases, including Dread Pirate Roberts, who Ross supposedly was the only one. Um, they had all kinds of abilities to tamper with this evidence that the jury was shown. And yet the jury wasn't allowed to know they even existed until after the trial. And the defense said, well, wait, we'll just postpone. They said, oh, well, we have to do our investigation. We don't want to alert these, these agents. And the defense said, OK, let's wait. We'll have a fair trial later. And the judge wouldn't allow that. And then it turned out they already knew they were under investigation. They'd been interviewed by law enforcement. So it was such a, uh, you know, travesty. And, you know, the Brady rule says you're not allowed to hide evidence that is exculpatory, that you're allowed to, the jury is allowed to know and things that are helpful to the defendant. And it, they didn't know a thing about it. It's absolutely remarkable. I mean, there's on yes. its face that deserves a, a complete. I mean, that is a mistrial. There's there's no way I around think so it. Too. Um, yeah. Well, the appellate court in New York uh, doesn't think didn't agree. And as but, you say, there's uh, now evidence for a third agent that deleted a bunch of information. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. Um, after trial, the defense they they loaded six terabytes of discovery evidence onto the defense pre-trial. That's a lot of material to go through. And um, so they didn't, you know, wasn't capable of doing it all. But they continued after trial and came across an obscure folder that um, had um, the material between DPR and, an, and someone called Not Wonderful, who was said he was a law enforcement agent and wanted to sell DPR information, which DPR agreed to pay him for. And there was another folder showing payments. This file was complete. What was in the evidence that was shown to the jury had a whole big part truncated, totally deleted, that indicated this corruption. And um, uh, there it was. And if that hidden file had not been discovered, no one would be the wiser. And um, it and deleted. The thing about digital evidence is. There's no fingerprints. There's no witnesses. You do not. You cannot forensically prove something's been tampered with. The other thing that was found during the same discovery was this login by using the Dread Pirate Roberts account seven weeks after Ross was in prison. We don't know. It only shows the last login. So we don't know how many times this person logged in, how many of them there were, how long it had been going on. But it's there. Now, this is not part of the appeal because this was not brought out in the trial because we didn't know about it. And so it would take another trial to have this come out. 
But which again was, seems like a travesty of justice. Yeah, and, and the the defense had a um, you know a um, press conference about it and wrote um, the government about it and has the information. It's not I'm not just saying it. It's it it's there, but you have to go through the legal steps. All right. Well, uh, unfortunately, uh, there is even worse news that, that has come out recently, um, obviously relating to the appeal of that uh, conviction. Can you tell us about the, the news? Well, the appellate court, the Second Circuit, um, completely denied the entire appeal, the, the convictions, the part about the corrupt agents, the um, sentence. So... That was devastating, frankly. I thought that they would at least give him another chance at a sentence because it, so many people were outraged at the sentence. And it's not just for Ross. There's so many, as I said, nonviolent people who who haven't physically hurt anyone. And I'm not saying, you know, look, you can make an argument for sentencing, but life for nonviolent crimes is just and there's no parole, there's no chance at redemption. There's no chance to make restitution. You're done. You are sealed away for life to die. And these are people who are violent. I didn't think they'd do it. And they even said, well, we might not have given that sentence, but it was under her discretion. So we can't change it. So then the next step is to appeal the appeal, um, which is um, petition for a rehearing. We hear that the Second Circuit very, very rarely rehears anything. And um, it's kind of like winning the lottery, but you try. And then the next step that's available is to uh, submit um, a writ of certiori to the Supreme Court on whatever issues, you know, you want them to hear. So the, the, the climb gets steeper and steeper. It's very difficult because 10,000 petitions are entered and, you know, submitted to the Supreme Court and they take about 85 of them. Again, like winning a lottery of sorts. Um, yeah. Well, uh, yeah. and I understand that Ross has been moved from the uh, Metropolitan Correctional Center in New York, where he was being held. Where has he been moved to? Well, um, and he was held there longer than normal because he wanted to be near his lawyers because he doesn't have email privileges and wanted to be able to work on the appeal. But um, so it's really a transitional facility. And which is why he hardly ever got outside at all, because it's uh, doesn't it's very contained it's in Manhattan. But now he's been moved. He's in a processing center is what they do. And they send them to Oklahoma. And he's like, wow, it's so spacious. It's really, you know, he's like, wow, it's not a closet, you know. But um, he's been as far as we know, he'll be designated to uh, Florence USP in Colorado, which um, not to the Supermax, which is like the you know, most serious supermax in the system, but to a high security, he doesn't, I was just reading over before the show, all the criteria for being in a lower security prison, which he meets all of them, you know, nonviolent, um, all the different things, no, none of these offenses, but because this judge gave him such a long sentence, he, all of those get swept aside and he has to be in a high security, even though he poses no threat to anyone because of this sentence. Wow. And of course, there are much more dangerous places. I'm very concerned about his safety. Um, things happen in maximum security prisons. Ross is not violent. Yes. He's totally peaceful guy, you know, and um, I, I am concerned. Well, not to add to the concern, but even the Federal Transfer Center in Oklahoma City is, uh, well, will be familiar to my listeners as the place where Kenneth, Kenneth Michael Trinidou met his untimely end at the hands of federal authorities. Oh, really? So, it's, Whoa, well, okay, I didn't know about that. <laughs> yes, it is not a happy where picture. Ross is right now. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, it is, a, it is a, a, just a terrible case in every way imaginable. And of course, if the intent is to send the message from the government to people out there generally that uh, just using Ross as a figurehead, that if you talk about agorism, if you talk about trying to use Bitcoin, if you talk about in any way trying to exist outside of the system we have constructed for you, look what we have in store. It's uh, a very, very scary message for them to be sending. And uh, I'm sure that there are people listening to that message. 
what has well, been? Let me say, say real quick for that because there's a criminal defense attorney, Scott Greenfield, who wrote in his blog. He goes, "That's why he got the sentence because he had the hubris to think that he could create a virtual agora outside government control. That's why because the drug drug sentences with the Silk Road offenders, the longest one is ten years. It's not about drugs. It's about an idea." It's about privacy. It's about Bitcoin. Um, Chuck Schumer, who's behind it, was on the um, his sentence Senate Finance Committee, and I believe uh, Bitcoin was very alarming to them. Um, it's about those things. It's it's the sensationalism around it. And you were very perceptive because when I, you right at the beginning said, "Wait a minute, there's a bigger picture here," and saw right past all of sensationalism. Very few people did. Um, so to your credit, because that's exactly what it is. And uh, so anyway, it's about you better not create an agora. <laughs> you better not because and it's it Ross is like the head on the spike of the medieval castle. That's what's going to happen to you. Now, it doesn't work, apparently, but that's that's what they're doing. Well, Ross, and we're, I thought we were supposed to be judged as individuals, not to be made some kind of sacrificial lamb. Yes. Exactly. Well, Ross is a political prisoner. I don't think there's any two ways around that. Absolutely. Um, has he has he made any mention of that? Has he talked about that aspect of this? Well, um, he, uh, yeah. I mean, he, I believe, agrees. We don't, you know, we haven't talked a lot about that. Um, I believe he he thinks that, you know, that he he feels like he's been treated very unfairly. And that he wants, he's dying to tell his story himself because he feels like the media has distorted it terribly, that the, that the trial distorted it, and he wants to be able to say who he is. He wanted to testify at trial. He wanted to be open and communicate and was advised not to and still has been um, because, you know, Ross is, when you read about him in the media and then you know him, there's such a disconnect. But it's also he wants to talk, you know, basically saying what he had in mind was privacy and voluntary interaction. That's what he cared about. Ross didn't care about drugs. He didn't really care about making a ton of money or any of that, you know, kingpin and all that. That's not who he is. So we've talked about all that. Yeah. Well, uh, speaking of media smears and kingpin, I have read (laughs) American Kingpin by Nick Bilton. So you don't have to. Uh, I don't recommend people go out and buy the book. But at any rate, I have read it. Um, would you like to respond to any of Bilton's reporting reporting in that work of non-fiction, yeah. quote unquote? Yeah, well, um, you know, Nick Bilton was very much wanted me to be involved in that book. And I was warned by someone who knew that it was going to be the government narrative. And um, he, the same person told me that Bilton or, and the people involved told that him that the government supplied them with material a year before trial. They fed them their version. So I believe since the government couldn't convict Ross of murder for hire themselves, they got Bilton to do it for them. And um, he bases the whole thing on this is true. It's not even proven. The The excerpts I've read have shown distortion about things I personally know about where, you know, things like, oh, well, he lived in a basement and it was a... Well, he owned the house where the basement was a finished basement. He owned the house. Ross owned the house and he rented rooms upstairs in college. It wasn't like he was some strange troglodyte living in a basement, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. okay, he lived in it. And there's a lot of this sort of distortion and sensationalizing that creates, I guess, a good movie treatment. I haven't read the book. Um, yes, please it's don't. Too um, for me to read. I really don't want to read it. It it really yeah. is uh, upsetting in a lot of ways, specifically because, of course, it's written like a novel or something, where he puts you in the minds of the characters as if he knows what as they're thinking knows. at right. a moment to moment right. basis. It's ridiculous, um, but very effective. I'm sure. I'm sure a lot of people will read that and come away quite convinced that they know what they know about the case. Uh, at any rate, there's well, that's a lot. problem being fed to the public. That's what happens. It's, if you really want to dig into this, it's work. It's, yeah, it's much more sensationalism, sensationalizing and kind of exciting to, yeah. Of course. Anyway, well, yeah. I, I mean, that's interesting to hear your response. Well, indeed. Because that's what I got from the research, yeah. Well, again, I anyway. just don't want people putting any money in the pockets of Bilton yeah, or his ilk. <laughs> so don't buy the book. 
at any rate, uh, well, there's so, so, so much that we should and could talk about here. Uh, I would like to finish up by talking about your own experience of this politically, um, in terms of your own awareness of or uh, uh, activism in the realm of agorism or the agora. What was your own understanding of this before any of this happened, and what is it now? I would say I lean towards um, entrepreneur. We, my husband and I are entrepreneurs. We lean toward please leave us alone. Um, I, when Ross was supporting Ron Paul, I certainly didn't disagree with anything there. So I, it wasn't a huge leap for me in that sense. But my eyes have really been opened by seeing up close and personal how the government operates. And I, I have been shocked and I have been alarmed. And uh, the precedents that are being set with this, uh, people really need to understand this isn't just about Ross and me and the, and the case. There are very serious precedents being set with this case that will trickle down into the courts in the future. And we're at a tipping point in history right now. And the courts are grappling with how to deal with all of these things. And, um, you know, the idea of vicarious liability where you can blame someone for someone else's actions, the use of digital evidence to put someone away for life when a mortgage company won't even take a screenshot of a bank statement. That court has a lower standard of evidence than a mortgage company. Or, um, you know, the, the use of corruption, of course. They or the preclusion of the corruption. But there's so many precedents that will impact all of us, the privacy aspect. The, I mean, there's so many. And I realized more and more as I was propelled into this, how this is so much bigger and how we, it's a, we live in serious times. And I, I'm very concerned about it. And so I do feel that it's a bigger mission. I do want to have my son free. I desperately do, but it's also a bigger cause for me now. And the people that I've met through this, who are just amazing people, um, you know, I think we're in a very important um, struggle right now. And I think we're in danger of losing our freedom and, and we need to people. I really want people to wake up about it. Well, if you want to know what the government is afraid of, just look at the way they treat people like Ross. So um, yeah. I, clearly, agorism is something that they do fear. And that's a message that I'm sure my audience will be receptive to, as it's something that I talk about quite a bit. So people who want to help you in your mission, in the appeal of the appeal, and in the outreach generally that you do at freeross.org, how can people support that, that mission? Well, there's all kinds of ways on, on freerust.org. Of course, one of the ways the government crushes individuals is to bankrupt them, basically. It's very, very expensive. Uh, so we always need financial help. Um, but also, if you have connections, if you have ideas, you can reach me through that website on the contact page. Just email me. I see all the emails. Um, and you know, any kind of connections to get the word out, to spread the word, to help us on social media, to spread the word, to counteract this narrative that's being, you know, that Ross is being smeared with as a person, as well as to point out the importance of the, of the issues that will affect us all. So there's lots of ways, uh, lots of different levels. And um, yeah, we really appreciate the support we've gotten, tremendous support and um, do need it. We're one family, you know, and uh so thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Well, as you say, this is about so much more than one individual or one family, but you are shouldering so much of the uh, the brunt of this. So I really do hope that people will go and help help out what they can in whatever way they can, uh, even just spreading information about freeros.org and about the work that you're doing there. Because again, this does affect everyone one way or another in the long run. All right, Lynn Ulbricht, uh, thank you very much for your time. I certainly do hope that we can have you on again in the future to talk about further developments. That'd be great. Thanks so much, James. Really appreciate it. The Corbett Report is brought to you by you. Your support makes The Corbett Report possible. Sign up for the subscriber newsletter or purchase a DVD at corbettreport.com support.